I would tell you no paper going to do that because uh, if you teach something twice a day, twice, you get bored. So this is naturally to make the class very <coughs> small. That's why we don't check the tendency because if you don't come <laughs> or you do your favor to your fellow classmates, so so university should count. You know, every year university publishes statistics. How many classes have a people fewer than twenty, fewer than forty? You notice every university including Hopkins publishes. I think the publishes is based on the data from from enrollment. So if a BME has hundred students, so every core required course is hundred students. That's not actually quite true. What does she do with the install camera here? And write face recognition software. So that actually <laughs> count. For example, today, you know, we have a small class. Small class is good for university because now they can count. BME's class size is actually smaller than what is the public. What are you gonna say? I think that's a good idea, so someone should do it. Because the number of the published online is not quite true. Okay, so uh, we are not doing any, uh, sh should I wear this? Okay. Uh, so we are not doing any, um, this, what are the oh, record? My computer crashed twice, you guys remember? I, th I think that's part of the problem. I bought a new computer and I, I'm not using that program. So um, I just got back from Europe last night. So so I better get, get it going before I start falling asleep because time jet lag. Um, any questions? I'll, I'll give you guys benefits of being here. So, any questions about uh, my part? Now that can cover by exam today. That is an auditory system I've been giving lectures. Any any questions? Before I start talking about something else, this is not in the exam today. Yes. So, I remember at one point there was a slide that talked about the difference between like the auditory systems of birds yeah, versus yeah. mammals? Yes. For, for I, I, yeah, in the oral time difference, yes. So question is? So just repeat for me exactly. So I know the birds only rely on excitatory stimuli or impulses. Yeah. So did everyone get a question? This is a very good question. <coughs> we, we did talk about the uh, interval time difference computation <laughs> in MSO, if I remember correctly. And we talk about two models in my slides. One's the birds model, or avian species, basically birds model, in which we, um, the, the mechanism works by, uh, by, by integrate excitatory inputs from both here, both here excitatory, and, and using the concept called the delay line. Because the neuron MSO need to have a very short temporal integration window. That requires spike from both and arrive nearly simultaneously. And that's how the uh, interval time difference can compute it. That was a birds model, right? We talk about it. Then we also talk about our slides there, say in mammals, it's not quite true. So in mammals, you have excitation from both ends and inhibition. The interaction of this gives you rise to the calculation. Okay. So if you, you know, if I were to ask a question, for example, uh, in, in the context of the class, uh, in, in, in a homework or any exam, I will, I will specify which model. Or you should specify which model, if you're not so sure, which your answer. You can answer either one if you have an option or the one that is being asked. We, do, we did talk about two models. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah, is that clear, everyone? Yes. So yeah. for the excitation inhibition version, yeah. it's still a timing dependent, right? So if you hear yes. it on your left side, that's right. Still timing dependent. Yeah. yeah, You excite the left that's side right. and inhibit the right side. Uh, not in uh, MSO. MSO, um, that is the, the, the nuclear we talk about the, to calculate internal time difference. Mm -hmm. They receive either in birds or mammals. They receive excitatory from both here. Okay. Got. In birds model, we did not talk about inhibition. We only talk about excitation. Okay. In mammal model, we talk about excitation both here and inhibition. Right, but if it's on the left side, you're going to get the excitation stronger on this side, stronger right. and first, yeah. and then you're going to get it on that side, second and like weaker. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I did not go into that much detail on exactly how excitation and inhibition come together, give rise to time difference. So I was a little bit hand waving. 
If I was hand weaving, I wouldn't hand weaving exam. The exam questions are much more easily. We, we make it clear so there's is there is a clear answer to that. But 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 what you got to the point? Yes. If you're trying to determine if a sound is in front of you or in back of you, That's is right. that just like the um, monarchal, like the monarchal, the notch, notch? The, yes. Okay. Yeah. Spectral. Yeah, spectral. Yeah, spectral. Is, is that clear, to everyone? The the the. So the shape. The of shape of the ear. That's right. Change and whether in front of you or behind you. Right, or, okay. or not only in front, behind, but all along this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah all along. Oh, but all the way to behind you. Yeah, yeah all the way behind. Well, you can think about 360 degrees okay. or below you. Okay, if you're going to stand somewhere in the middle. That's because our ear has shape. So, so if you got this, if, if I change the question differently, for example, just for sake of exercise, um, if, if, I, if you artificially lose your ear, external ear, uh, people do lose the ear because of accent. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, your external ear is gone. I mean, can you tell? Front and back. Can you tell sound if you close eye, close the turn off lights? Can you tell sound come front and back? No. 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 You would know what side. You, you can want to lose. the same, like the angle is the same in right. front of you and behind you, it would be it right. would sound the same. It would be sound the same. You absolutely cannot tell. Yes. Uh, can you explain how phase locking works in the auditory system again? How phase locking works? Uh, do, you know, do you remember how phase locking, how phase locking was created? Yeah, but in the auditory system, like how would um, like what's specifically unique about it? But, 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 but it's, it's a good question, but this is a one of the fundamental questions I cover. But can you, let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, where did the face hacking originate? Where? It was like the spikes. Okay. Well, because the spikes you can't observe. But what before that, what stage before that? Do you guys remember that I, I use this hand, we said this is a hair so? Right, there's a hair so, there's a base of memory, there's a ste stereocilia, right? And when, when you have a tone that vibrates here, and here, hair so go left and right, there's something on top of that. Then this gets push this way, that way. When you go push this way, mechanical channel opening, arm flowing, then neuron, they still become uh, depolarized. When you go this way, they remain hyperpolarized. That is the origin of face locking. Okay. Is, good? is that one clear? This is the origin of face locking. The neuron firing later on was read out. But, but you, if you say face locking is in, in the fiber, neuron firing, that's what source of face locking. That's not correct. Correct always it goes here. Yes. So are the neurons the only neurons that exist face locking? Uh, no. We're about to see in some attention neuron that have face locking, but it was different. Uh, different mechanism. In the auditory system, the, the source of origin of face locking was very clear uh, because the uh, hair so the, the movement on one direction channel open, another direction not open. So then there were for one 360 degree cycle of tone, you own half of them, you, you got a depolarization. Therefore, you got a face locking. It's a mechanical process. It's a mechanical process. Okay. All right. Yes. <coughs> Yes. Um, so how does it work for then the higher uh, frequency? Right. I, I remember I talked about the uh, another mechanism where you can encode the repetition by fine rate change, but no in the absence of face locking. I, I think I have, have a couple of slides to specifically talk about it. This corresponds to the sensation when you did my first or second homework, where when you hear click train faster than about 30 hertz or so, you hear them continuous. Right? So you no longer use face locking, but 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 the fine rate change the function of of a repeating rate. Another thing is that I, I to be precise, the limited face locking is not a 200, 2000 hertz. There was a curve I gave, right? The curve began to drop about one thousand hertz, and eventually died out about four five thousand hertz. Okay, so that is a curve that describes the limit of face locking. At the auto nerve, that's the beginning. Everything else after that, higher than that, goes smaller. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Wait, so if we're asked to cut off the phase locking, what should we put? Is uh, it 2,000? Or should we put that it's somewhere between 1,000 So and if, if you have that curve, that, mm -hmm. right, if that curve goes down, mm -hmm. that's like a filter, right? You, you can consider that as a low pass filter. Okay. If you're an engineer, which you are, um, I see. <coughs> 
how do you describe a cutoff of the filter? You can say I have a three dB or six dB. Okay. Okay. Right. That's. But if you were to ask it, or you can say, well, X percent. But the process, if you're going to ask it, that's exact three dB, six dB. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't exactly give that number, but, but this answer you could come up, okay. given the concept that you have, and that number is probably you can look at that somewhere between one to K. Okay. But then it completely died out, um, and 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 about five six K. But, but in, pra in practice, when we ask questions is to not make you not feel um, confused in a short period of time, normally we ask, you know, typically ask you extremist conditions where phase action is absolutely is there, or the conditions the absolute is not there. So you want to know what is the boundary mm -hmm. below which you have it, definitely have it, above, above we don't have it. But if you're going to ask questions about exactly where I have it, then you have to evoke this filter concept. Okay. Otherwise, it becomes more obvious. Okay. All right, so, so let me uh, move on to, to talk about some sensory system. I, I want to probably finish the handout today, and then, then we'll continue on, 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 on Wednesday. And uh, the summer sensory system, as I said at the beginning, is, uh, uh, is one of the la three larger um, big, uh, sensor, big sensory systems we're going to cover. Um, you have heard of auditory system and visual system, and this is another one we'll cover. And then towards the end of the semester, um, there are one, two lectures, uh, slots are left open. I'll come back to summarize all the sensory system um, and so that you can have a view after you hear one of them. And uh, I think we said at the beginning of the class, I'll mention again that in the final exam, the final exam contain an opponent that run across the three uh, all, uh, all, all lectures. Okay. Um, now, before that, I actually have to uh, let you know, since you are a student in, in this department, that. Uh, this is a professor who uh, used to teach a similar sensory system uh, about two years ago. His name is Steve Shaw. He's a, a professor be before he passed away in 2014. If you look, see, he's pretty young. He's uh, you know, little, little older than me. And, uh, and about two years ago, he, got a, he has a cancer. So he died away uh, uh, prematurely. And Steve is a, a friend of mine. He is professor in neuroscience and biomedical engineering. And uh, he has been teaching this class. Basically, he, he has been giving lecture. I will about to give it to you for about 15 some years. And he is a, a graduate of a PhD program in our Department of Biomedical Engineering program in 70s and 70s or 80s, maybe 80s. Okay. And he stayed on as a professor here and has been teaching us for many years. Uh, the reason I want to show up here is for you to appreciate who has done the work that uh, makes it part of a, a literature learning. I mean, I said at the beginning, one of the benefits for you to be in Hopkins as opposed to uh, other colleges is that you get to hear from people who actually create knowledge in addition to convey knowledge. And uh, Steve is one of such a person, is a wonderful professor and, and a colleague is. So, I'm, uh, so start last year, I began to, uh, I started giving his lectures because we don't have a, a replacement professor yet. And I do have a credential to give this because when I was a postdoctoral fellow, I spent four years studying some sensory system. So this is my very second passion. So uh, it's, it's a sort of bittersweeter um, experience for me to, to give this. Now, while we uh, talk about some sensory system, it's, it's, a, it's obvious for good reasons. May I give you some examples here? You say, what do we do uh, with the hand? Uh, you can hold the, um, a baby's hand, and uh, as a parent, you can feel enormous uh, information here. And of course, you can do sports, and many of you play instrument. They all require some sensory system. Okay. Um, now, uh, another way you use some sensory system, not people in this classroom, but uh, quite often in society, is that if you are blind, um, you use your finger to read, and that's how you use it. And of course, if you're an artist, uh, if you're engineers, and you use your hand, it's really few shapes. One, the point I want to make here is that uh, so much sensory system, that now I began to contract this. Now, since you have a heard auditory visual system, I began to contract this system whenever I can. And uh, because I believe this is really the best way for you to appreciate the system and across a different system. And uh, one of the things I want to emphasize here is that so much sensory system is not two dimensional. Quite often, you feel, you feel something here. It's flat, but in situ, this is three-dimensional. I hold this, I know I hold a cylinder-like structure. I hold this, I know this, this shape is different. 
Okay, so your sensation of of uh, of the object come from your integration of of a sense signal from your figures. Now, um, and and also. Uh, the uh, sensory system also has a sense of a detect vibration, right? Here I show you that when someone, uh, um, uh, uh, some work is trying to engrave a um, small object with potentially, uh, 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 this is not a vibration, but, but something that is hard. So when you scratch it with something, you can feel the vibration. And then we'll talk about which, uh, what is so responsible for this, but is this really vibration you can detect from here. Similar to here. When you put your finger on a string, you feel the vibration. This is why, you know, you guys know uh, I have an iPhone there. When iPhone has this uh, guitar application, some good ones, you do this, you actually feel vibration, right? I mean, it's just screen. Why do they put a vibration? The general vibration give you a sense that you're actually feeling a guitar that, that is motion. And that, that's really a simulation of our, what our sensory system is. Sensory system expire. Um, expect. Of course, uh, there, there also you grab something, you have motion. All of this, if you think about it, it's, it's a very complex system um, for, for us to work on. Okay, I might block your view. No. If I block your view, you want to move here. Okay, yeah, maybe you want to move here. So I think uh, I will say this side is better than, than this side. Thank you. Now, so what I, what I will do is that now we're going to walk through uh, the system from skin to the brain for you to appreciate how all those experiences uh, with our hand primarily uh, is, is, is transformed into the brain. And, and how does a neuron computer here? Now, um, this is to show you some sensory efferent fibers from uh, various parts of our, our skin surface into the body. And here's the spinal cord behind us. So there are many nerves and ganglion cells that connect to receptors in our body. And a fingertip is being one of them, right? Finger is here, and you, you go into dorsal ganglion cells, you go to spinal cord, from here, you go into brainstem, and, and the brainstem here, then you go into thalamus, and, and the cortex. Now remember, you hear thalamus by now at least three times. There's a thalamus of visual system, a thalamus part of auditory system, now we we'll talk about thalamus part of some sensory system. So all sensory system, go through thalamus. So thalamus is a gate to the brain. We talk about brain as, as a cortex, okay? Now here I showed you uh, all the body parts that go into different parts of spinal cord. So now we understand that when, when people have an accent, depends on which part of their uh, spinal cord is, is injured. And it will uh, lead to different de de definition that is a loss of sense. So the higher your damage is, the greater loss you have. So your body parts basically from lower to up is the word my play here. Okay, this is the word uh, terminology we use to describe this. Okay, now um, that's anatomy. How how you how it connects basically any any of your sensory parts from hand to foot to mouth, you know, to nose, all connect to to your to your uh, spinal cord. Now, the next thing we talk about is different modalities is within the somatic sensory system. Now, in auditory system, I mean, let me call you back. How many modalities in auditory system? Now we talk about modalities in somatic sensory system. Here we talk about touch, we talk about pain, we talk about temperature, we talk about each. All of them together give rise to some sensory system in your fingertip. So your fingertip, you think about it, your fingertip can sense, can sense each of every one of them. So we call each of them modality. Most time we talk about some sensory system, we talk about tactile. Tactile is only touch. So some sensory system means a greater range of sensation beyond the touch, that including pain, temperature, and each. Okay. Now in auditory system, how many modality do we talk about? Two, which two? Um, and uh, I mean, in, in a very um, peripheral at a receptor level. How many modalities do you have? Did we talk about modalities in outer system? That, that in, in, in contrast to these. I mean, your answer is, is, is not wrong because we do have a, a sensation for pitch, for other things. 
but, but they are not quite a modality, they are property of the sun. Modality means they really operate through different channels, which in a few minutes we talk about. So in our system, we won't talk about one modality, right? How many receptors we have in our system that convey that modality? How many type of receptors? How many? One, two, three, four, five, six? <laughs> how, how many? Anyone just take this? Do we have one or more than one? Some of you say one, yes. What is that? Inner hair cells. Yes, absolutely. This is now we can begin to appreciate the, the contrast between different systems now. Um, outer system, we have one. That's, that's, that's inner hair cell. Outer hair cell doesn't count, remember. Outer hair cell responsible for efferent, not responsible for efferent. Efferent is what we feel. Now, visual system, how many? How many receptors? Visual system. Two. Which two? Razcon. Yes. That's correct. Now, when you come to the somatic sensory system, many. More than three. More than four. Okay? That's, that's, that's a very important concept you, you, uh, you bear in mind. Um, now, in the final example, I will tell you that uh, there, are, there are general questions that we expect you you be able to answer questions like this, that is one cross the system. Because now we have a comparison, we ask one compared with NARS or so. Uh, if you can um, figure this out, basically, now you have a really good solid understanding of the whole system as a whole. Okay. Uh, now, let's go back to here. So in a touch, in a touch modality within a similar sensory system, we talk about spatial forms. So these are the different neurons, fibers, we'll talk about in a few minutes. We talk about texture, movement, flatter, and a vibration. Okay, flatter is, is a slower repetition, 10, 20 hertz. Vibration is a faster. Okay, vibration is, is faster. And then, um, then in the pain domain, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time, not much. So there is different uh, burning pain, pricking pain, the different pain, there are different fibers. Then there is a temperature domain that you can feel cold and warm. Okay. And of course, there's each. This is relatively new. Uh, people just begin to actually study this in, in, in recent 10, 20 years. And uh, the, the mechanical vibration we know for a long time. So what you can see now, this is a very complex system. And uh, some of you may, must have read um, about uh, uh, robots, about brain much interface that is robots in general can build a, a kind of similar to a human hand. Almost all the robots that people have produced uh, only have the, this part. Okay. Of course, you can argue a robot doesn't need to have your pain. If it's hot water, so what? I just dig into this, right? Okay. But other things, like a temperature, each, all of this, if you're going to really build a robot engineer that mimic human hand, that people say, what is, it, what is a human hand? You go there, shake someone's hand, right? And uh, you probably don't want to shake the hand with, with the robot that people build in there. It's kind of scary. You're, you're, you're afraid that thing is going to squeeze your hand. What is a human hand? You shake a human hand, that's uh, just a one sec and the two second shaking in a social setting. How many things you can feel in your hand? I will just give you a sense. Some. So, so, so just, when you shake some hand, did you get information? Okay. What information you get? What, what information do you think you get? Like how tight they squeeze your hand. Oh, they have a the hand and? Their hands like all sweaty. Or <laughs> sweaty. If someone interviewed for a job for medical school, maybe you're very nervous. All right. That's different. What else? If their hands are soft. What's that? Like Softer, like rough hands or something. Yeah. You can feel basically, this is that if you think about it, this is the way this at work. Okay. You feel the person's strength, a person's eagerness to meet you. And the person's personality, their mental state at that moment, all of that is that one shake, right? You shake, you feel the touch, and you feel, feel the temperature, all of that, right? Now, if you can build a robot, that handshake, well, you shake that robot, you feel you're shaking a human being with, with, with the individual characters, that would be remarkable. I think that, that would be goal for engineers to build something like that. Okay. It's actually not, not yet. So you think about this. Okay. Also because most engineers don't know that our hand has all those sensors. Most people only think about this part. Okay. 
Now we, we talk about the, um, uh, let's first talk about tax receptors. So we, we let's discuss what is within this monolithy that allow us to feel different shape, different characters. Okay, this is a very um, an amazing fact that you most time you don't feel feel that our hands do it. So if you take your fingertip, so in humans, in monkeys, so primates, most of the developed sensory surface is our fingertip. Less so is the back of the finger. Less so is the other, you know, as a foot or thing. But this finger, if you s lightly scratch in your, in, your, in your skin, you know this is your skin, you know it's here, you know this is close, and you know the surface. More than this, you don't even have any finger. If you take something, this object, I can scratch here. I can scratch on the bottom of this. I can figure out if there's a groove or anything. So our hand actually can detect that uh, vibration, very subtle vibration, not, not directly on your finger, but through something else. So this all comes through the tactile receptors. So here's the tactile receptors. If you take a finger here, cross section, look, cut, look downwards. So this would be tip of fingers. This is skin, and this is what underneath the skin, okay? So what you can see here are several type of neurons, receptors that are lying there. The very top of here, there's a nerve ending, that's the answer. Then you have a messner's corpuscle, macrosols, and then you have a deeper here, raffini ending cells, and a very deep here, a Pacini and corpuscles. So basically from our skin, from a superficial layer to a little bit deeper, you have uh, several type of neurons lying here. I will cut a long story, long story short that these are responsible for different sensation. For example, if you, um, if you take your fingertip, you take the uh, Q-tips, Q-tips, you loosen up the carton here, so very light. So you lightly, lightly scratch your fingers, just tiny, tiny bit, you feel this. That feeling comes from very superficial layer of mesonous corpuscle from here, okay? Now, if you squeeze here with your fingers slightly with a little bit of thing, so now you feel a little bit of pinch pressure, then it's a deep neurons like we I feel here, okay? If one, something you hold here, you're driving car, the car can start, you know, if you run a rough road, the car is, 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 is vibrating, the steering wheel vibrating, you feel vibration? Vibration comes from Pacinian corpuscle. So you guys are all driving now. I assume all of you have drive. You have experience that at night, at the night you drive on the highway. Suddenly, you probably have half falling asleep. Your car is turning towards the side, and it's vibrate. It wake you up, right? And then that is mechanism of people. You people put a groove on the side. When it vibrate, your your basic before you can hear. I mean, eventually you hear if it's loud enough. But you can't have a window closed. But but a vibration transmitted from a wheel to the chest, to the uh, steering wheel. And that's your Pacinian, Pacini uh, corpuscle that feels this. And, and uh, now, now I will jump a question very quickly, then you, if I can ask you now, if you're gonna design, say, very general now, say, go design that group. So we wake someone up if they, this, their, their car is off the road. Now, how, do, how are you gonna design that group? You think about this? Well, you can. What it means, what is the gap between that? How are you going to do? If, if we're going to ask you now, in a few minutes you will know the answer. What do, what do you have to consider? That uh, you design that so that a car around that, somebody half asleep will be wake up by vibration in hand. What do you need to know? Speed of the car. Speed of the car, yeah. You take assumption. 60, okay. And? The, I guess, optimal frequency. The yeah. What is, that, what is the optimal frequency? 4K. Well, you, you can measure that. So the answer is correct. If you're going to do that, you are a biomedical engineer, you want to know frequency sensitivity of this. Right? So this thing is a sensitive, most sensitive, more sensitive to some frequency than others. And if you know that, you estimate what is the speed of a car, you're gonna, you're gonna, the guys are going to run in, then you, can, then you can design exactly that spacing. So that vibration reach the hand more sensitively. Now, now you see, you know, even, even with a semi nape just pure engineering design there, actually require you knowing something like this. Um, 
Okay. Now let's move on for, uh, to continue to talk about this. So knowing uh, there are different receptors at different uh, depths occurring here, the next thing I want to do is ask uh, how would each of the receptors respond to stimulation of skin? Uh, what is the property they have? So there are two ways you describe their property for somatic sensory neurons. This is somewhat different from auditory and visual neurons. One of them is to describe the size of a receptor field. So I'll give you an example here, uh, four type of neurons. So if we're going to measure receptor field, uh, this is size, this is how you measure. So we're not doing experiments. So the way to measure is, uh, first on the fingertip, is I take a very small fiber, okay, it's a hard fiber, then I lightly touch the skin until the, this neuron fire. How neuron fire, or you can put an electrode here. The electrode here is connect the nerve. Just like, you know, somewhat similar to the uh, nerve experiment did. Then you let it touch. So, so what uh, this illustrated here is that if I touch here, they're firing. I touch here, no firing. So eventually you can figure out there's a, there's a small area that causes no firing. This is a similar sensory tactile receptor field. So what you see, see here is that for these, for messengers, so the mercury cells, this receptor field is, is small. And then this is a big. Remember, we said, these two neurons, so perfusion neurons, are for light to touch. And this deeper one is for something with a little bit of pressure. So when you pressure here, you, you have a more diffused one. So that's two properties. This will come handy when we explain how these uh, receptors partic participate in the form and texture discrimination and the sensation. The second way to describe this is to describe their time property. So look at the two type of neurons. Messenger, Mercury, their receptor field looks about the same, but they're different. They're different by how they respond to time course over here. So here's an experiment to show you that if we, we apply stimulus, it goes up and it stays on and it goes off. This type of neurons, messengers, is on and gone. So we call it rapid adapting. They only show up here. And whereas this one is slow adapting. Even though they have a similar receptor field, this is important that they have different time properties. So this, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more later on, but the combination of these properties allow you to basically feel what kind of texture is. <coughs> Remember, when you feel textures, there are all kinds of stuff here. If this have a little bit of engraving on that, you move around and you fix it. You require neurons that detect the beginning, that is age as opposed to detect the presence of something, even though it has small risk of field. And, and these two type of neurons, the Pacini and uh, Ruffini, also has a contrasting property, this being fast adapting and slow adapting. So these are two terms we introduce here to describe the time response property of small sensory neurons. Now, this will be, uh, this will be a nightmare for exam now, right? <laughs> So I give you a list, they will go through some of this, and then we'll talk about this. So now uh, the, I list here all type of receptors. We, we just light, just quickly gone through. And uh, their size, we differentiate it by small. There's two types of small. There's two types of large. Okay. Remember, in auditory system, we never talk about the which nerve or hair cell has a large or small receptor field. Right? Remember, we say the hair cell is a hair cell. You take hair cell, put a dish, you cannot tell. We never made that distinction. In visual system, did we make that distinction by receptor field being big or small? I guess someone, anyone, you say, where did we, what is the distinction? Well, in terms of what frequencies? Of well, in terms of receptor field size, does anyone remember? Did we talk about their size difference? Well, in, in visual system, right, in, in retina. Okay, so in audio system, from 100 hertz you can hear to 20,000 hertz. Was that distribution of properties uniform or non-uniform? Approximately. Uniform or non-uniform? Is there any particular frequency that things that just get very sharp? Did we talk about it? No, in our system, for the or first order approximation, we talk about everything is uniform. What about the retina in visual system? 
you guys remember? Right in the center, what do we call? Fovea, right? Uh, and the sight is a peripheral vision. So in the center, your vision is sharper than the edge. That's why you always look here, and your peripheral vision is big. So fovea is, is like, it's almost like this. And your peripheral vision is almost like this. But did we, did Dr. Connor discuss the size of the receptive field for cones and the rods, that the center and the side? Was there a difference? All right, think about this, okay? Yes, what? Are you saying like the cones are in the center and like the rods are more on the outside? Yeah. Okay. But there are different, the point is that, I just want to link it to you here, that they are, in a, in, they, in, a, in, a, in a visual system, we differentiate those properties by being the foia and the side. And here, we talk about on the fingertip, the typical fingertip, your five fingers, right? And here, we first differentiate properties by being large or small receptive field, okay? And then, we then here, we talk about locations, then we'll talk about axons that are connected to here. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize, but we do need to talk about this so you know when we come back to here later on, we we'll notice it. So let's, let's just look at this too, right? Um, the axon diameter is roughly the same. This is a diameter axon to connect to them. Then there's conduction velocity. Now, do you guys still remember the conduction velocity you guys measure in the lab we did it together? What, what is speed? Is this close to here? Not that far. It's, it's roughly in this way. Some of them are higher. I think most of you measure somewhere on the lower end of this. Okay? So, axon contact. So, this is actually very interesting in lumber. Uh, keep in mind for now. Okay? And, and, then, and then the sensory function, they participate. For Merkel, is for form and texture perception. This is for motion. Okay? And uh, effective stimulus is either age, curvature, or skin motion. Now here's my question. Um, why? Why, why Markel, the, the effective stimulus to drive this is age, or point, or corner, or curvature versus skin motion? Why is that? Which property would I just talk about? Why, why we say this? this these two properties for the, for the two type of neurons that have similar specific, one is for age, one is for skin motion. That's because of this we just talked about here. Because Merkel, well, one is rapidly adapting, one is slow adapting. Rapid adapting means this is age. You see, things change. So if, you, if, this, is, if this is more rough, if you go cross finger here, you, you run to age, come down age, Every time you have age, suddenly up or down, this is going to fire. But when things are flat, you kind of go here, it doesn't fire. And whereas this does opposite, that's why um, these are not really uh, um, abstract form. And they, those two properties, rapidly adapting and slow adapting, is associated with these two properties. Okay, so let's continue. This talk about the um, recipient field areas, uh, blah, 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 you know. Special activity. Okay, so so this is um, um, this is what we talk about here. So this numbers frequency ranges that you give frequency. So let's go from here. Now then let's talk about here a little bit. So Pacinian and, and moments ago we talked about the, the threshold here, and you can see the frequency. This is a vibration frequency give. Pacinian can respond somewhere between five hertz to thousand hertz. Okay. Whereas uh, you compare these two, they're very low, slow. So among all the fibers our skin, Pacinian capacitor, we call it PC for short, responds most broadly. In a few minutes, we're gonna see a curve that show you the most sensitive frequency, somewhere in the middle, is about 300 hertz. So it's do have a frequency tuning, okay. Now, this is a still very narrow compared to hearing. But there's a very important concept here. So my sensory system look at the receptors as if they are frequency respondent. So they measure all of this. So at the beginning of research, of auto research and somatic sensory research, they are mixed together because uh, people think they're all vibration because of the frequency properties, okay? 
and uh, we'll go come back to, to revisit this, this, this uh, table later on. And uh, I suggest you spend some time in the textbook uh, version of this. Uh, go through here, make sure you know what is this number does mean. Okay, so, uh, so whether you can make sense of it, whether you can relate it to other things we'll talk about this. Okay. Now, how, how does the Pacini uh, neurons respond? That's because it has channels that were open or closed in response to deformation, right? So when you pressure the, this uh, Pacinian uh, corpuscle, the channel were open or closed here. And that really gave rise to its detection as, the, um, as, as, a, as a mechanical respondent for this. Now, here's, here's a, a, a frequency curve that, it, that we can measure. So if you do the following experiment, if you get a fingertip here, that's just a sensation, uh, perception experiment, and I use a small probe, much smaller than this, then I apply the vibration frequency on this. And you use the methods we talked about earlier in the class, like psychophysical methods to detect a threshold, right? Very similar to the way you measure auditory receiver field. Then what you find is that here's tuning curve, threshold, Okay, threshold of a fin typical human uh, finger. The threshold is the lowest, it's about two, three hundred hertz. Okay, so just to, to go back to the question we talked about earlier, if you're going to design that uh, grooving on the, on the road side, the frequency you want to hit given car speed is in this range. This is what we feel most sensitive. Okay, the rest of them is less than this. Yes. Um. So before you're saying that uh, it depends on the force that you apply on the yes, on the force. Is there like, like, w will you where to change? Yeah, yeah. Good question. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I did not apply force here. But if you uh, apply force here, threshold would change. But this shape larger to stay. So threshold threshold would shift. Um, if you apply force, threshold probably should shift down a bit because if you push it a little bit harder, I think it would be a bit more sensitive. Good question. Yeah, we didn't put a force here. Okay. Now, uh, this is a perception. So this is psychophysics. And, and, and later on, people kind of related to what, what is behind, what gives the rise is here. So this is a range, is a Pacinian corpuscle. And this is a range for other rapid adapting fibers. And this was figured out by, uh, if, in order to get this, you basically, in order to do this, you, you have to take the electrode, go into the axons that connect to Pacini, then record the firing rate when you change the <coughs> frequency. Then you can figure out that Pacini is here. Okay, so this is actually a very important one. So that's for the, uh, for the receptors. So we very quickly talk about four receptors that are different by their size and by their uh, rapid or slow adapting property. But these receptors are connected by efferent fibers. Okay, so here, th here things that got really complicated. So so now we look at all the fibers. So these are receptors you have seen now. And they are uh, fibers that connect with them. So for fibers now, we give them a name based on their, whether the slow adapting, rapid adapting. There's two types of slow adapting we call here. There's a Pacinian we call here. Okay. Then on the same, either same skin side, which is plot on the side, they're, they're really intermingled. You have fibers that are connected for each and for the temperature and for there, and they all have different size. Okay, so basically underneath here, there are many, many types of fibers here, and they, uh, the different fiber for different modality have different size. For the touch, the fiber tends to be larger, and for the pin, pin, and, 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 and each other thing is smaller. Now the fiber you guys work on for the frog nerve, the actor nerve, they are in the order of a, a alpha fibers is here. So, and, and based on the um, compartment models that you think you guys have learned from last semester, you can estimate, we get a sense on the conduction velocity as a function of fiber size, right? So the larger the fiber, the faster it move, okay? So the fiber, fractal nerve fiber you measure is in this range, okay? And then now you see for the pain and other things, how slow fiber man. So here's an experiment that, that you could do to prove that it, 
these things are quite different, but you, you, not, you should not do. I tell you conceptually, here's one experiment. If you fill your bathtub half with very hot water, but you don't know. If someone fills your bathtub half very, uh, very hot water, okay. So if you don't know, if you, you're going to take a shower, or you take a bath there, you take your food, of course, bare food, you put it into here. Now, question is, do you, do you feel there's water first, or do you feel water is really hard? Is there a way you can avoid sticking your foot into the hot water before you know it? Think about this, think about the two speed, right? So, so the moment you, your foot touch the water, then receptor for touch and pain both activate immediately with some. But you, your brain doesn't know this until the action potential transmitted through your hair all the way to your spinal cord into here, then you decide. Which signal gets your brain first? Touch. So the moment you, you, feel, you put here, at first you feel a touch. Okay, I, I, my, my foot is in the water. The second th thing you feel is what? It's burning hot. But by then it's too late. Your foot is in the water, it's being burned. That's because of this. This is only two meter, less than two meter per second. That's 30 to 70 meters per second. You can calculate the length. It's substantial. So, so the basic story is that if you don't know that water is hot in a bathtub, and no one told you you can put a foot under, there's no way you can avoid it. You just get burned. Okay, this is, this is what the physiology behind here. Now, this story I just told you now, I hope you remember the difference between the speed of two fiber from here forward. <laughs> That's all you need to remember for now. Okay, um, and, then, and I will let you to read here. Read this on, on your own, okay. Now, another thing is that if you take the fiber, of course, this fiber not running by itself, it's running together. So if you take the fiber, you cut a cross section, then you will see a larger one, small one. So the frog nerve we did is more than like this. And also, some are mining it, some are mining it. Okay. So the large fiber tend to be mining it, the small ones are mining it. Okay. So the last slides are here before we finish that. Now, if you can measure conduction velocity, this is highly relevant to actually the lab we did. And for the bundle with all kinds of fibers, you can see that the larger fibers, the, uh, this is the velocity, the conduction velocity. And there's a di diameter. This is diameter can velocity. So the larger fibers here, the slow fiber here. Okay, this is the you know, temperature, this is touch. Okay, so this, is, this, this showed you really diversity of the receptor here, diversity of the fiber and fiber size. Okay, so we're gonna continue to discuss this uh, rest on the Wednesday. Any questions? Okay, since we have exam, I'll give you five extra minutes to go home to prepare. Okay, good luck on your exam tonight. See you on Wednesday. Lecture